Hello, my name is John Morgan. Where and when were you born? I was born in Kirkman, Iowa in 1926. So how old are you right now? I'm 92 years of age. Do you feel like you're 92? No. How old do you feel? Perhaps in my mid-70s. Physically, what is it like to be 92? <laughs> Sometimes it's a challenge. What do you mean? Well, I'm not as, not as spry as I was at 30. In actual in actuality, being ninety two has been a big handicap for me. I hike regularly. I enjoy hiking the desert, walking dog. Uh, I do have a lot of activities. I do a lot of reading and uh, studying. Uh, I'm doing uh, okay for a guy ninety two, I guess. What branch of the military were you in during World War II? I was in the Marine Corps. And what specific units were you in during your time overseas? Well, I went overseas with a, a replacement company uh, to New Caledonia. And that, uh, after several weeks there, went to Guadalcanal and uh, joined the um, a replacement company with the 22nd Marines. And so just state for the record what division, regiment, and company you ended up being into combat with. At the beginning, the 22nd Marines were part of the 1st Marine Brigade, uh, and I was with a replacement company uh, until the invasion of Guam. Uh, when I was assigned to uh, Company G of the 22nd Marines. Eventually it became a part of the 6th Marine Division after the campaign at Guam. What was your specific role in Company G? Initially I was a rifleman uh, and then uh, after the campaign at Guam, uh, I was made a fire team leader. Fire team is only four men. So. Tell me about the job of a fire team leader. Well, basically, you take instructions from uh, your officer or your squad leader or your platoon sergeant uh, and uh, Make sure that the other three are in the positions they're supposed to be in uh, with the equipment that they have and uh, uh, do what we're ordered to do. Um, what was the highest rank you achieved by the time you left the service? Corporal. And where all did you see combat in World War II? Uh, in um, the Mariana Islands, the uh, uh, Retaking Guam from the Japanese was the first one. Uh, and then we returned to Guadalcanal to uh, form the 6th Marine Division and began to prepare for Okinawa. Uh, however, at that time we did not know where we were going until a very short time uh, before we invaded Okinawa. Can you talk to me about your actual experiences on the island of Guam. Did you actually see combat there? Periodically. I was with, as I mentioned, we were with a replacement platoon for the 22nd Marines. And uh, uh, after the uh, initial invasion, uh, we came ashore and our job uh, largely was one of uh, accompanying Amtrak's with ammunition and supplies uh, to the uh, units on the line, and then returning frequently with uh, dead or wounded. That, yeah, I was 17 when I first went overseas, and 17 
when we invaded Guam. I had my birthday on Guam. Turned 18. Wow. Yeah. So, okay, so Mr. Morgan, um, just to backtrack a little bit, you mentioned you were born in Iowa? Yes. Did you grow up in Iowa? Yes. Where did you grow up? In southwest Iowa. Uh, in my childhood, we moved to Ames, Iowa when I was uh, a little later in grade school. Talk to me about growing up in Ames. What kind of things did you do for fun? Well, I, Ames was a nice college town, and we lived right across the street from the campus. Uh, and I used to, uh, with some encouragement from my mother, I used to uh, visit the various department museums and uh, university programs, music programs, and so forth. Uh, and of course, we played sports and games and so forth. So. What were you planning on doing with your life before the war broke out? I had no idea. I had no idea what I was going to do. Yeah. So, talk to me about your family structure. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, uh, I have one brother. And my uh, parents were, uh, were divorced when I was quite young. So I had uh, actually uh, uh, a lot of good support from my mother, and I had uh, surrogate uh, parents and aunts and uncles, particularly one aunt and uncle, one set of aunt and uncles. So we're very uh, supportive of my brother and I. Tell me about that uncle. What was his name? Well, his name was M Morris. <laughs> But he went by the name of John, and uh, he was a World War I veteran, combat veteran of World War I, and uh, uh, could be crusty guy, but uh, he's one of those people that can be crusty and you know that he loves you. So he was a, a wonderful support for us. Talk to me about your memories of growing up in the Great Depression. Yeah, I was I was small in the worst part of the Depression, although it, uh, I certainly remember a lot. My first memories were of seeing WPA work groups uh, working on uh, digging ditches and improving ditches along roads and removing uh, Brush and so on and so forth. I saw quite a bit of that. I remember seeing uh, the Triple C folks, uh, guys, uh, in a, in a Triple C camp, and uh, but I never saw them working. Uh, with my parents' uh, divorce, uh, my mother was left pretty much her own devices in terms of economics. And uh, she had a very fine classical high school education, but uh, that didn't uh, didn't do much for her economically. So she really struggled financially to support it. Uh, Tell me about some of those struggles. Well, just finding work. Just when she tried being uh, a waitress, and uh, she got a job doing that and she was harassed in that job, so she quit. Uh, she finally got a job for 25 cents an hour at the university, uh, just sorting papers, filing and that kind of thing. But, uh, she built a small career uh, in, uh, at the university, eventually. <laughs> yeah. um, did you all ever go hungry? Uh, Right at the first year of the divorce, we had some uh, food issues, yes. However, the aunt and uncle I was telling you about found out about it, and they made sure that didn't happen uh, much longer. So. 
what I remember food-wise was that we had some days where my mother went to the store and bought skim milk, which in those days was less expensive than regular milk, and she bought day-old bread, which you could get for five cents a loaf, and then she broke that up and made it, served it like cereal with a little sugar on it. And, uh, I kind of liked it. <laughs> what did she call it? I don't know. I don't know. So, talk to me about the kind of things you would do with your buddies when you were a teenager. What kind of mischief would you guys get into? I wasn't a mischievous child. I, I, I don't think I ever gave my family any, any heartache until I joined the Marine Corps and went away to war. What about on Halloween? You wouldn't pull any pranks on Halloween? No, I didn't. I didn't like Halloween. I never have liked Halloween. Yeah. It's a very pagan ceremony. I think. Yeah. Um, how did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Uh, <clears throat> at the back of the place where we lived in Ames was a, uh, a large vacant lot. It one time had been a uh, there had been a home there that had been destroyed by fire, but it was all leveled and crashed. And I was out there playing, we were, a bunch of us out there playing touch football. And somebody came out and said Pearl Harbor was being bombed at that moment. Well, that's how I learned about it. What was that like for you to hear out, to, what was that like for you to hear that your country was being attacked? Well, I was upset about it. I don't know that I understood. How well I understood it, but I would know I was upset. So what did you all do after you had heard the news? I don't really recall what all we did at that particular, you mean the same day? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't remember. I probably almost assuredly went to the radio and listened for more news. And. Uh, of course, eventually, in a day or two, we heard from President Roosevelt on national radio. Uh, that was uh, an important part of uh, the war effort. His, he was an amazing leader, I thought. But I came from a family of Democrats, so <laughs> not, not everyone in my family was a Democrat. <clears throat> um. So take me through. How did you end up in the service? The microphone. How did you end up in the service in the first place? Well, I just simply don't to join. I tried to join. I shouldn't even tell you this, but I tried to join before I was old enough. And I got caught and sent home. How old were you? Sixteen. Yeah. And what branch did you try to join? Marine Corps. Yeah. And uh, so as, uh, when I was 17, of course, then I could sign up. So <clears throat> I don't remember exactly why I was so enamored by the Marine Corps, but I was. I don't know how I got that way. <laughs> Can you explain to me, though, why you wanted to join the service so bad in general to the, to the point where you were willing to go under age and join. Well, I mean, I mean, you knew that there was a war going on. Mm -hmm. Why did you want to put yourself in harm's way? Why not wait till you well, were drafted? First, you have to first understand that I really didn't understand what war was at that age. Uh, that is, uh, that takes experience. But uh, I did have a uh, uh, patriotic motivations. Uh, most assuredly, uh, and I, <clears throat> I think the uh, attack by the Japanese uh, on Pearl Harbor was such an insidious uh, thing for them to do that uh, I probably felt like a lot of Americans said there was room for revenge here. You know? I don't know how much I thought I was going to uh, 
how much revenge I was going to extract at that age, but, but uh, I, I know I felt that way. So, yeah. so Why not the Navy or the Air Force? What was it about the Marine Corps? Well, the, the the Marine Corps had this mystique to, about it, uh, first to fight and uh, the holes of modernism, uh, that sort of thing. So I, I like that. And so, well, <clears throat> I I went to a, a recruiting office quite some distance from my home so that they wouldn't know me, and. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I went to a recruiting officer, it was a very small recruiting station, and uh, signed up for it. And he asked me a couple times how old I was, and I afraid I fibbed about that. And uh, <clears throat> at any rate, uh, it was going very well, and I called my uncle in Iowa, this uncle, same uncle that I told you about, and uh, told him, and he drove to the recruiting station and told him how old I was, so, and got the whole thing undone. So, Why did you call him? I thought he probably because he was a veteran that he would be supportive of me, which he was, but not yet. <laughs> So how old would you? How old did you tell the recruiter you were? Seventeen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so after you get caught, what was your mother's reaction? Uh, I don't think she quite knew quite how to cope with it, but I do know that when I did sign up at seventeen, I learned later, much later, that she decided to, you had to have permission at seventeen of your parent. And uh, that she decided to go ahead and sign the permission because I was so intent on doing it that I was probably going to try something strange like I did when I was 16. So she just went ahead and signed it. Hmm. I think she was reluctant. And uh, actually the war experience was very painful for her, uh, for me to be gone. Did your brother serve during the war at all? World War II? No, he's younger. No. So, after you joined the Marine Corps at 17, where did they send you for boot camp? San Diego. I, I, I was sworn in in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, spent the night in... Uh, not the most expensive hotel I've ever been in. And we took the train with a lot of uh, uh, Marine recruits, Navy recruits, and some soldiers on that train. And uh, it came through Kansas uh, and actually came down here to Arizona. And we were informed that for one section of it, because the rail lines were so busy with transporting troops and c cargo, uh, that they were routing us through a rail line in northern Mexico to get us to San Diego, uh, which was interesting to me at the time, because at that time I thought it was a big deal when you crossed a county line. <laughs> uh, so I thought that, wow, I'm going to Mexico. Uh, and so... So we had boot camp at, at San Diego Marine. Marine Corps Recruit Depot. And take me through a typical day of boot camp. <laughs> uh, well, after the uh, early part where you get clothing and a, and a permanent haircut and uh, so forth, they, they got us up very early in the mornings. Uh, we had uh, exercises uh, with a rifle. Uh, and uh, a lot of drills, uh, marching, and uh, you know, that kind of thing. A lot of, we had a lot of uh, movies, uh, training movies, uh, and propaganda movies. Like what? 
uh, why we fight no more. Uh, How did they depict the enemy in these movies? Beg your pardon? How did they depict the enemy in these movies? Uh, especially the Japanese, they treated them as something less than human. You know? uh, and of course, with uh, the behaviors of the Japanese uh, forces in China and other places, it was pretty easy to believe in it if you're a young guy. Probably closer to the truth than the Japanese would want to believe. Yeah. Huh. So, uh, tell me about the actual physical regimen that you experienced in boot camp. Well, it was pretty hard. It was difficult. And uh, there were a lot of things like um, uh, jumping off of a of 20 foot platform into the water and, and making a uh, life jacket out of your out of your coat your duggery coat and uh, swimming to the other end of the pool uh, uh, one of the, one of the training exercises we had that was the most uh, arduous I thought was to have to crawl a very long distance under machine gun fire uh, at boot camp. That was, a, they had set up a, a, a 30 caliber um, heavy Browning uh, machine gun and they just kept firing it and you had to crawl on your belly. Uh, and there was no incentive to stand up <laughs> whatsoever. Uh, a lot of running. Um, that's about all I remember about it. We had a pretty good drill instructor. I, his name was Belsky, I remember. Uh, but the rascal that he had as an assistant was... Uh, he was no cup of tea, that's for sure. He, he was much harder on us. What would he make you guys do? Oh, he, we'd get up at midnight and go out and do some running. Uh, get up at three and uh, I don't do uh, those rifle exercises where we lifted them up and down. And, just different things like that. He, he, he was uh, not, he would have been in trouble for some of the things that he did, I think. You know, he got a little rough. And then he, have you ever heard of gas stamps? Tell me. Well, uh, during World War II, there was a terrible gasoline shortage because the military had all the gasoline, but civilians could buy it, but it was very uh, limited and they gave you stamps uh, that, uh, and we didn't even have a car, so we never had stamps. But, but uh, you had to have those stamps in order to, uh, in order to buy gas at a gas station. Uh, that it, you had to not only pay the money, but you had to have the stamp. So, uh, but uh, he wanted to drive to his home in New Orleans, but he didn't have gas stamp, and so he took us out and ran us until he got enough gas stamps from guys that he could drive his car to New Orleans and back. So he kept making you guys run until guys gave up their gas stamps for yeah. him? Yeah. He yeah. sounds like a real jerk. Uh, yeah, we didn't care for him. We didn't care for him, yeah. Uh, so, um, can you tell me what do you remember about the expression, you'll be sorry? Yeah, we used to use that, that a lot. I used to hear it a lot, especially in boot camp. You'll be, you'll be sorry. You know, when you first arrive at the camp, you know, some guys go by yelling, you'll be sorry. But uh, I don't remember that being, being really common, but I, I certainly heard it. Yeah. Did you have any experiences with uh, what would happen when uh, a Marine would call his rifle a gun? Oh, you don't do that. What would they make you do? 
oh, push-ups or run around for uh, a few laps around the, the uh, parade route, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a no-no. <laughs> so, can you take me through, we'll come and we'll cover some of this stuff as we get further along, but I would like to get straight to your combat. Uh -huh. After boot camp, what happens to you? Well, I was uh, sent to Camp Elliott, which is a camp that doesn't exist anymore. There are a couple of buildings uh, left in that camp. It's in San Diego, and uh, at, the, the, at that time, San Diego being smaller, it was on the north side of San Diego. And they, uh, they did uh, all kinds of what really kind of infantry training there, uh, riflemen, uh, BAR training, uh, two levels of machine gun training there. Uh, and I did rifleman training at Camp Elliott. And I was there uh, about, about not long, a two and a half months, maybe something like that, before I shipped overseas. Hmm. And, and where are you sent? Overseas? Island of New Caledonia. Uh, New Caledonia is a f French colony, and it was a intricate, interesting experience for a Iowa boy. He, uh, <clears throat> that we were allowed to go into the capital of Noumea. One had one liberty in there, and it was really a French town. It was since it was a French colony, so you felt like you were in more like you were in France than you were in uh, uh, an island in the Pacific. Uh, <clears throat> there were a lot of the plantations there, and there was a, uh, a village. And the people were not uh, indigenous to New Caledonia. They were from the island of Java, which is now, of course, part of Indonesia. And they were... Uh, brought there to serve as labor for those plantations. And, uh, they lived in uh, houses with thatched roof. And uh, what was uh, surprising to uh, a youthful Iowa boy was that uh, the women didn't wear tops, just just uh, skirts, uh, which I found very, very interesting. Uh, we did some training there. I took the longest hike I ever took, uh, Marine Corps or personal life. It was a 25 mile hike. Full fuel pack? Yeah, full pack. Full pack. Including a, a rifle, cartridges, uh, everything. So, how heavy would that all be? Hmm? How heavy would everything be? I don't really know, but I would guess maybe 65, something like that. Uh, we started out after dinner and uh, hiked all night and uh, it didn't stop and take a break now and then. And it, of course, the officers were in jeeps. Uh, <clears throat> but it was, uh, I was surprised when I got back that I felt as good as I did. I had breakfast and then went to bed, so. but I felt fine. So from New Caledonia, where do you go? Uh, they start breaking up the, uh, most of all of the people at the New Caledonia camp were uh, to be replacements. And that's when I went to, uh, we were sent, a group of us to uh, Guadalcanal and we were adjacent to the to the 22nd Marines. 22nd Marines had been <coughs> to uh, Inuitak Island and had taken uh, that island uh, in the um, Pacific. <coughs> and uh, we were replacing some of the people who had been uh, injured or rotated or, or whatever. Uh, but it wasn't assigned right away. Uh, was under a, a lieutenant uh, named Bohannon, who also was from Iowa. That's probably the reason I'm 
part of the reason I remember it, but I kept running into him through life, in fact. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and uh, we uh, then boarded ship and, uh, with the uh, 22nd Marines that went to uh, Guam for the invasion, but we didn't invade Guam for a long time. What transpired was that it was simultaneous with the invasion of Saipan and Tinian in the Mariana Islands. And uh, the 2nd Marine Division and the 4th Marine Division were trying to take those islands and they were having a heck of a time. So they kept the 1st, uh, the 22nd Marines and 4th Marines, which was uh, at that time called the 1st Marine Brigade. We kept those at sea and kept us in abeyance until they made sure that, that we weren't going to be needed on Tinian and or in Saipan, particularly Saipan. So we floated around out there for days and ran out of, uh, pretty much ran out of food. And uh, we had probably as many as eight or nine days where all we had to eat were canned figs. And uh, then we went to Guam and then the invasion took place. Now as a replacement, I did not, our replacement people did not go in like on the first wave with this kind of the guy. Uh, we came in and joined him a day, a day or so later, and the role there depended on what uh, uh, they wanted done, but mostly it was things like, especially initially, taking uh, ammunition to the front and bringing uh, casualties back, usually inside of the tra Amtrak. Uh, and on my birthday, which was uh, about four days after that, something like that. Uh, the night before, uh, we were behind the, the very uh, company, George Company, that I would eventually be assigned to. We were right behind them, and they, they took a Banzai charge uh, on the Rota Peninsula. And the uh, uh, there were casualties on both sides, but on the Japanese side, it was horrendous. You know, I mean, there were literally hundreds of them died. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the next morning, uh, after that evening, that nighttime Banzai, uh, then uh, I was one of several people involved in burying the Japanese. Uh, they brought in, it was, the Rota Peninsula, at the base of it, there was an old marine barracks there from pre-war. And uh, uh, <clears throat> that's where that Banzai took, charge took place. And uh, so they brought in uh, CBs, I guess it was. They, they dug very deep trenches with bulldozers. And then we carried the Japanese bodies uh, to that uh, uh, those trenches, and they used the bulldozer to cover them up. So it, it's in the tropics, and so it was a pretty horrific odor. Well, they, you know, they deteriorate rapidly, and uh, uh, already they were uh, full of maggots and flies, and uh, that's uh, very dangerous for the people who live around there and the and the marines who were stationed around there, uh, that, uh, that had to be taken care of. And they did very, that's why it was done that way. It just had to be expeditious. It had to happen fast. We had no gloves or anything. We just car carried their bodies. We basically, what we did was we, we dragged them, you know. We took hold of their legs, their feet, and pulled them to that gravesite. And, uh, put them in the gravesite, and then watched while the bulldozers covered them up. And, and describe to me the scene, I mean, how many Japanese would you say there were? A couple hundred. A lot. Did you come across any that were pretending to be dead, or did you come across any Japanese that were still alive? No. No, they were dead dead. The first American dead I saw was a Marine lieutenant. It was a blonde-haired guy. And uh, 
we put him in a Amtrak and I took him. We went down in the Amtrak to the beach and then a, a Navy uh, uh, small boat and uh, came and, and uh, took him and a couple of other bodies back out to a hospital ship where they had uh, facilities for the deceased there. Talk to me about the difference when it comes to dealing with casualties of the enemy versus casualties of your own. What was it like to see American casualties versus Japanese casualties? Because well, there's a difference. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Much, much more sensitive to the American dead, yeah, because you can, you can associate, you know, their reformation got to go I sort of a thing, you know, and uh, and from our tribe, not their tribe, you know, and so forth. Yeah, and in very insensitive to the death of the uh, uh, enemy soldier, and sometimes to his, you know, later on, you know, to civilians. Can you describe to me the general terrain on Guam where most of the fighting took place? Um, it was it was an open area, but very tropical. But lots of tropical plants and trees and so forth. That uh, and Arota Peninsula was uh, well developed. And that. Uh, you know, there were buildings and houses and so on and so forth around that area. I don't remember t too much about the area, but uh, I do remember that much about it. So. Did you come across any uh, active Japanese soldiers when you were on Guam? You're talking to me about the casualties that you dealt with. But did you have any experiences with live Japanese soldiers on Guam? No, very many. Some. Can you tell me yeah, about those? See, the, then I, see, remember I said I was in a replacement platoon. Uh, well, then I had assigned to George Company. Uh, and when I got assigned to George Company, they were heading to another part of the island, which was uh, a dense jungle. I mean dense. And uh, <clears throat> and so when I joined the uh, the company that, uh, and the first platoon of George Company, there were only seven Marines left in the whole platoon. And uh, and so when we got there, then uh, we were probably up to around fifteen in the platoon, about half, not even half strength in it. And our job in that part of it was a lot of the Japanese, uh, when they lost a skirmish or a battle in the initial part of Guam, where we were located, they fled out into the jungle. Uh, and so we went out looking for them. Uh, so that's... Uh, that was a whole other kind of experience. Well, it, it's uh, it's the uncertainty of going through a jungle and not knowing what's there or if anything is there at all. And uh, so there were surprises sometimes, and sometimes there it was boring, except for the fact <laughs> that the jungle was kind of hard to get through and you find trails and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, the, uh, some, some boys were lost up there. Uh, some of our boys were lost in that area. But, but it wasn't a, like a lot of pitch battles or anything like that. But, uh, so my combat experience on Guam was more related being on the front supporting with ammunition and you know, that kind of thing. What do you remember about the surprises that you mentioned? You mentioned you guys came across some surprises. Uh, well, 
sometimes the Japanese were were waiting. Uh, I never, I did not have a big surprise, you know, myself. Uh, but the, but the other guys in the unit did went out on patrol. So, no, I, I didn't have a, any really difficult ones. I just was uh, surprised how uh, how dense that jungle was. You know, how that, would you guys get so unpredictable? Yeah. How would you get through the jungle? How would you cut? There through? were trails. Animal trails. You guys wouldn't use machetes or anything. Uh, yeah, we had machetes. Uh, I don't remember if I used one or not. I don't recall. Um, I, I think usually a squad leader, but but there were animal trails that, and you could follow those pretty well. But the, maybe the top part might be kind of overgrown, so it had to be kind of whacked out of the way or pushed out of the way or something like that. Oh. Oh. So we'll come back to Guam, but after Guam, what happens to you? Well, we, we took a ship back to, uh, to uh, Guadalcanal, almost the same place, for the same location it was at before. And uh, <clears throat> we got back in, in the fall of, uh, that'd be fall of 44. Wouldn't it? And there was a uh, but the big event was a whole new regiment, the 29th Regiment, came and joined uh, to form the Sixth Marine Division. And then, <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, uh, we went from 14 people in our platoon. And, and probably all the other platoons in, in George Company uh, to the to full strength, and, and that's why why at eighteen I became a fire team leader at eighteen because even though the, the guys who came in were a, a lot older than I, I had a fire team, my fire team that I worked with. The BAR man was 20, uh, the B, assistant BAR man was 26, and the rifleman was 26. But you know those guys, they, they never ever made me feel like, you know, I was uh, too young or too, so forth. But, but that was just a, kind of a luck of the draw in the sense that I had seen combat. And they were fresh from the United States. Uh, and they were good guys. Uh, I was lucky to have three guys on the team like that. Did they survive Okinawa? They all survived. And they were all wounded. And the VAR man was uh, very severely wounded. Uh, Gordon. Uh, Shafto was his name, and he he died about 1992. But uh, <clears throat> he uh, he was a pretty tough kid. He's from Wyoming. I think he fancied himself as some of a cowboy. You know? and then uh, the uh, sister P. A. Uh, I I remember really, as long as I was around him. I never really quite figured it got him out or I ever really got to know him very well. He, he, I thought he was from Michigan, but it turns out I think he was from New York, upstate somewhere. His name was Palladino, Ralph Palladino, Italian boy. And he should not have been in the Marine Corps. Uh, I don't know what happened that he got into the Marine Corps, but he was completely illiterate. He could not read or write, either one. And he never talked, and he just stayed to himself, but he wasn't stupid, and he just was illiterate. Uh, and then uh, the other team member was uh, Elihio Jose Padilla from Albuquerque. Uh, I really liked him a 
a lot. And uh, he was uh, 26 when he was married and I thought he had one child, but it turned out I learned later that he, at that time he already had two kids. Uh, and uh, they lived in uh, Albuquerque, so. But they were a good group. And uh, the rifleman uh, Padilla and I spent a good many hours uh, in a good many places in a foxhole together. And of course the BAR man and his assistant, they were constantly together in a foxhole so various places. So. No, they were, uh, they were all, all three of them were wounded. Yeah. Uh, Shaft of the North was most seriously wounded. And uh, uh, Padilla was se fairly severe, and I don't think Paladinos were, were very serious. That was on Okinawa. What was Shafto's wound? Uh, well, at first he was shot. He, he was shot by a machine gun, a Nambu machine gun, and uh, he was hit, uh, I think, twice, including in the chest. And uh, I made uh, some efforts to uh, to help him out some uh, first aid, and he uh, the uh, the uh, the machine gunners the Nambu machine gunners uh, I guess saw me working on him and then they fired at us and hit him again and not me. Uh, and that time they broke his arm. Uh, pretty seriously shattered his forearm. Uh, so he ended up getting hit about three times. Uh, I saw he came to see me after the war. He, he did a long stay and hospital at the Great Lakes Naval Hospital. And I was in Ames, Iowa after the war. And uh, he stopped to see me and I wasn't there. And he, he taught his bride with him. Uh, he married uh, like a nursing assistant or something. And uh, so he, <clears throat> he found out I was out at that uncle's house, which was about a hundred miles away. So. By telephone, I figured out how to get him out there, and I got to see him, and he was doing well. He still, he had a lot of, was having a lot of problems with his arm, but uh, he was doing doing pretty well. He was alive. He was alive, yeah. yeah. But uh, Dia, I, Dia, I stayed in touch with him for several years after by, by mail. I, I've got a picture of him there that he sent, and. Uh, he was a he was an amazing guy. I thought he was the first uh, first Mexican American I ever knew. <laughs> so uh, take me through the training you all experienced on Guadalcanal uh -huh. in preparation for the invasion of Okinawa. Well, it was it started out as standard jungle training because what can help the jungle, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> and then uh, I don't know we got to probably two or three couple months before the we left for Okinawa, even though we didn't know where we were going. But a couple months before that, the CBs came in and built these artificial houses, fake houses, uh, with windows and <laughs> doors <laughs> and so forth. And uh, so that was a big clue. We weren't, we weren't going to use that jungle training that we've been having. And we worked hard out at those places, going down these, these streets that, that uh, 
weren't really streets, but the, and jumping through windows. And so I remember there was one area there where I, I kept jumping <clears throat> into that house through the window. You were supposed to do that. And I would always scrape that shin on that thing. I couldn't stop doing that. It got really bad. And uh, in Guadalcanal, uh, they used, we used to all suffer from something called jungle rot. It was a skin disease. And you could get that just wading through the swamps or anything. I mean, from a little cut or even maybe a large pore in your skin, uh, it would ulcerate very, very fast. Uh, I got one on my nose. Uh, and so when I scraped that, then, you know, then I really had a mess because I, I had to, uh, uh, had to somehow treat it. We used to treat ourselves uh, with, with a, early uh, uh, antibiotic called sulfon sulfonilamide. And it was a little grainy, powdery kind of a substance. And we'd put that on the uh, ulceration. And it did a pretty good job of taking care of it. Uh, Talk to me about your experiences with dysentery I never had dysentery. Not even on Okinawa? No. Wow. No, I never had dysentery. What about malaria? No, I didn't. I Did you didn't take Adabrin? Yes. What would Adabrin? Well, Adabrin you took on Guadalcanal. We didn't take Adabrin on Okinawa. But on, 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 on Guadalcanal you took it? Yeah. What would it do to you? Uh, well, I kind of, I just remember it kind of upset it. It, it tastes are terrible. Even if it was a pill, it, yeah, you turn yellow. You turn yellow. You got a kind of a yellow complexion. Uh, so, yeah, that's, I'd kind of forgotten about that. So, uh, um, after uh, Guadalcanal, take me through how you guys make your way to Okinawa. Uh, on Guad <coughs> Guadalcanal, we took a standard troop ship uh, to. Uh, the Palau Islands. Uh, there was a, a one uh, island of the uh, Palau called Ulithi Atoll, and uh, we put into that, and uh, we uh, met. Uh, we were placed on an LST that already had Amtrak in the LST and Amtrak crew, Marines, and. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we're, so we're out in the middle of this big lagoon uh, and had to make that transition by boat over to the LST. Uh, and then we took the LST to, um, uh, Okina to Okinawa and uh, we were scheduled for first wave, and uh, which caused a certain amount of apprehension, uh, except when we got to Okinawa and went in on the first wave, we didn't get the usual uh, welcoming party that we had expected. Uh, there, were, there was no Japanese fire, n nothing. Uh, I wasn't disappointed, but I was sure surprised. And uh, in fact, uh, there was a big Japanese bunker right where we landed. Uh, and uh, it was uh, full of women and children, Okinawan, little guys. Uh, I, I remember uh, I went in there and tried to find out where the soldier, Japanese soldiers were, and uh, they didn't understand what I wanted, and I'm sure they would have, they wouldn't have told me probably anyway. And <clears throat> it was a. The lady had the cutest little boy. He was about two years old, you know. And I reached down to toss all his hair and the mother screamed. She thought I was going to kill him. And I just felt terrible, terrible about that. I decided not to toss all any more 
kids hear her in there. So, uh, so that was very quiet, and then we moved on to a airfield called uh, Yontan Airfield, and uh, there were a lot of wrecked airplanes and so forth that had been damaged by our uh, American aircraft and by naval bombardment and so forth. So that was the, the initial trip to Okinawa. Can't think of too much else. It was pretty quiet. Take me through your first experience under enemy fire on Okinawa. Well, see, we, we did a right turn. We did a right turn and went north. It was our job, and uh, <clears throat> and so the it isn't that we weren't shot at, but we weren't shot at very often. And uh, we went to a town called I think it was called Nago, and it was a peninsula called Mobutu, I think, that went off to the west side of uh, Okinawa, and the fourth marine regiment uh, went up the, that peninsula and they they ran into uh, some gunfire, a lot of it in there. And all we did was, we didn't know if there were Japanese forces further north or not. So we stayed there so that the fourth wouldn't get trapped on the peninsula. And uh, so there was uh, some shooting there and some uh, about halfway up to the north end of of uh, yeah we had two instances going north on to uh, the very north end of Oklahoma and once we got up there and that was found to be pretty secure we found some peculiar stuff up there but like what a fairly high-ranking Japanese officer. I'm not throw myself. I don't know what, what that was all about. Did you see him? Yeah, I saw him. Yeah. Well, what was he doing? Well, oh, somebody, when I saw him, some other guys had already grabbed him. I don't know. He captured him? Yeah. He, 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 he was very arrogant. You know, he let us know that we were... Uh, peons and, and our worst yet American peons, you know. Yeah. That was really weird. Uh, what about, uh, you mentioned you had two incidents on the way to the north. What were the two incidents? Yeah, a, a soldier uh, uh, was off to, we were marching north just with packs, you know, and our rifles. So, and there's a soldier off to the right that uh, uh, gave us some trouble and then r ran away and he didn't run very far. And... What do you mean? Uh, killed him. Who? Well, several of us. No, I'm saying this was a Japanese soldier? Yeah. Yeah. And then another one came, came through I don't know if these guys are strikers or who they were, you know, but anyway, they, the guy came through, uh, through a line that tried to come through our line at night. I don't know what he thought he was up to. And when I tell you the rest of the story, you'll really wonder what he's up to. But at any rate, we spotted him and he was killed. And then in daylight, we went over and we often did when it was safe enough, we would look the body, you know, it's, it's, he had four pockets, all full of condoms. <laughs> yeah. It's, That's odd. Uh, yeah, I, uh, what else do I say? I mean, you know, it's just crazy. I, mean, I don't know what that was all about. Uh, um. Yeah, well, a Japanese soldier, uh, was on the right right side. We didn't see him, and uh, and then he uh, uh, made a d decision that 
he would uh, uh, fire at us. And then he took off and he ran over to uh, just kind of a small cliff thing and tried to climb up over that and to get away from us. And uh, he didn't make it. Well, we shot him and killed him. Yeah. Was that your first time firing the rifle? On Okinawa? On Okinawa, yeah. Probably was. I might have looked for that, but I don't remember. But that was a whole bunch of you firing at the same time. Yeah, not very many. Not very many fired. Yeah. Yeah. Is it just instinct at that point? Huh? Is it just instinct at that point? Yeah. It's just like a reflex. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, these two incidents happened before that Japanese officer got captured, correct? That happened on the way there? Yes. So after that Japanese officer gets captured, take me through um, what happens to you all. Well, uh, we had one uh, potentially very uh, dangerous situation that happened. It was not by the Japanese, but uh, we were on the very far end, north end of Okinawa. And there were, one event that we saw was a, a aerial dogfight between a uh, Japanese Zero and a, and a uh, I don't remember which kind of plane that was, but they were an American plane, Navy, naval plane, and the uh, Japanese plane didn't come out well, and it crashed right at our site. And uh, so a bunch of, uh, some of the guys went down there, to, it was maybe 40 yards. Uh, some of the guys went down there, and I decided I wasn't going to do that. I didn't want to see what was there. And uh, then uh, the company, hold all of George Company, made a move over to clear an area, sort of be sort of south and east of where we were. And uh, uh, we got over there, and that's where we saw the Japanese officer. And uh, over there was a, a uh, vacant girls, girls academy. And, uh, uh, but there were no Japanese soldiers or any, anybody around it. But all of a sudden we were under fire from the Navy. Uh, the uh, uh, Naval um, Aviation, uh, Navy planes, uh, were, uh, trying to strafe and bomb us. And uh, I was most concerned now, but I, I was most concerned that, that maybe they had napalm on that thing, and, because it, that would really be ugly. And uh, there was a huge Japanese cave that had been abandoned there. And we went into that cave and I kept thinking about the Japanese caves that I saw on Guam, and all of the guys I saw that were dead inside of those caves from the napalm. So I was hoping the Navy wouldn't drop napalm on us. And it, communication was so primitive then that it finally uh, uh, Captain Stebbins got word uh, to uh, battalion, battalion got word to regiment, to division, to the Navy. And they quit straving us. Uh, Were there we any had no casualties. Say that again? We had no casualties. Which makes you then wonder if they're the air support for you. <laughs> How well, they effective are they? <laughs> That's funny. So there's a mixed message there. Yeah. Yeah. Did you really feel that when you thought when you heard that there weren't any casualties? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I do. I did think of that. Um, so after that incident, what happens? Well, we had orders to move south. Uh, the whole uh, division 
was going south. And uh, we were placing a, an army division on the, uh, would be the west side of the front. And uh, uh, we heard that it was going really badly down there. And uh, so we knew we were in for uh, some difficult days ahead of us. Uh, and there were a couple, there was a symbol that I will never forget that has no importance whatsoever, but I just will not forget it. It was a, first of all, it had started raining. It was, it was pretty miserable. It was a cold rain. And we had been told about, in, uh, some sort of a training or information thing we had to watch out for a particular snake. On, it's called a habu, I think. And it's, they told us how big they were, and how dangerous they were, and so forth. And as we got in these uh, trucks to go south, and we got down probably, we probably going about five, six, seven, eight miles, something like that. And I look up in this bear tree with not a leaf on it. And it was a big habu up in that tree. And I, I kept thinking, is this a message <laughs> that, that I, I'm getting here that I see something that, as ugly as as ugly as that? So, so it's not important, but I just remember it happening. And, it was important for you. It was yeah, a symbol of yeah. what you were about to enter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we went down and uh, uh, formed up to uh, replace the, uh, I think it was the 77th Army Division, but I'm not sure. It was, and uh, the uh, commanding officer of the 6th Marine Division was Lemuel C. Shepard. Later on, he was coming down to the Marine Corps. And of all the grunty little muddy Marines, 18,000 or whatever, he picked me to come over and talk to me. He, he over, basically, I don't remember exactly what he said, but basically they were questions. Are, you know, are you ready for this? You know, this is going to be difficult. And I said, yes, sir, I'm going to be ready for this. Uh, kind of thing. So, but I can't give you... Uh, uh, recite the exact words at all. My uh, my uh, fire teammates said that I, I said why did why did he come to me? He said they said because you look so young. <laughs> they may be the reason I don't know. Uh, uh. Were you ready? Thought I was. Yeah, I believed it. Because even though you had experienced some combat on Guam, that was nothing to what you were going to experience, right? Yeah, this was much harder. It turned out that way, yeah. yeah. Um, before we get into your combat, talk to me about the conditions on Okinawa, the living conditions that you and, and the fighting conditions that you were in. Well, it, it certainly was muddy at the first part of that. Uh, venture and uh, the uh, the land was pretty bare, but the, a lot of that was from artillery fire and so forth. Uh, we were on a ridge, and we could look down on that ridge uh, on a, to a river. I think it was called the Asakawa, and uh, but that formed an estuary where the ocean backed up the backed up the water. And uh, uh, there were, uh, I'm sure, a lot of Japanese on the, soldiers on the other side of that, that river. We, that's what we found out for sure. But you know, I couldn't tell it when I first got there. Uh, so we stayed there in the mud and in the foxholes for a short time. Did some... Uh, forays down into the, uh, towards the river, t 
to see whether what kind of reaction got from the Japanese. We had uh, we had two uh, two casualties, death casualties. What happened? Uh, they were killed by Japanese gunfire. Uh, I no other way to explain it. Were you with one them? Of, one of them was with Ernest Wooten, which was a good friend of mine. I, back before New Caledonia, you know, taking the ship from San Diego to New York. He, he and I were doing buddies all the time. Who? His name was Ernest Wooten. He's from North Carolina. You're too young to know about the uh, old TV series called uh, The Waltons. I know about it. Yeah. Well, he would have, if he'd have lived, he could have fit into that that series. The Southern Hillboy, you know, from Kannapolis. He was a farm boy from Kannapolis, North Carolina. And uh, he died on uh, one of those forays down there. Were you with him? No. No, he's in a different, different squad. Different, different platoon, in fact. Um, t can you tell me about the rain and just what it's like? I mean, uh, it was a cold rain. I mean, yeah. but, but the, the thing is, people nowadays we're so sheltered that when we have rain, you have umbrellas or you go inside. But you guys, you know, explain how it rained and you stayed where you yeah. were. Yeah, you, know, you you got a poncho, and you just throw that poncho over yourself if you're stationary. If you're moving, there's nothing protected from the rain. Uh, you should get wet. But, uh, yeah, it, a foxhole fills up uh, with rain. And, uh, no, it's not pleasant. Yeah. So after this incident with Shepard, when he comes and talks to you, mm -hmm. take me through your first real experience against the Japanese soldiers. Well, <clears throat> it, it's kind of first before we actually uh, are on the move against the Japanese, we, we were kind of defensive because we were under heavy fire, artillery, really a lot. Just, yeah, it was, it, we, we might get, you know, an hour break, so, but uh, <clears throat> when we were on that ridge before we us down. I, I couldn't see how we were going to get across that thing. And so, uh, but I got fooled in the Marine Engineer Company. <laughs> they had gone down there in the middle of the night and built a footbridge that you could go get across that estuary. I could not believe it when I saw, saw it in the morning. I knew we were going to go down there, but I, 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 my hat was off to those guys. How big? Because yeah, I don't know how, if they suffered casualties down there. I mean, the Japanese were on the other side of that river. But how big, how wide was the river? Forty feet. Maybe. Swift current or what kind of current? No, it wasn't swift. No, because the ocean was backing it, water up, and it was the water was moving slowly into the ocean. Yeah. Even if they didn't build the bridge, couldn't you have waded through? Oh, I think that would have been a good way to get shot, because you'd be a very slow target. Well, did you guys take any casualties when you were crossing the footbridge? On the bridge itself, no, no. Everybody on our in our unit made it across that bridge without getting hurt. But were you guys taking on any fire as you crossed the bridge or no? No, I don't remember ever being getting shot at there until oh. we got on the other side. Okay. Then we began. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, the first casualty we had was our platoon sergeant. And he was wounded, seriously wounded. And it was a Seriously wounded in in a way. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe. He was a giant man. See, he was a replacement. We had, back on Guadalcanal, we had a 
a, a platoon sergeant that was new to us and uh, he was very, very unpopular. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, Lieutenant Roos somehow got rid of him and got this guy that came in. And I'm not exaggerating, this is unusual for this age. That guy was at least 6'6". Six, six. His name was Kemmer, and uh, he was from New York, New York City, I think. And uh, so <clears throat> we got across that bridge and got up into kind of a rocky area. And he was sort of out front of me a ways. And he turned, he came, turned and he came coming back toward me and he had blood all over his face. And he had a hole in his helmet and the bu a bullet had gone through that and, and just put a big, cut a big uh, gash in, the, in where he, his top of his head, in his hair and so forth. And I said, I said something to him, two things to him. Uh, one is, that guy's not a very good shot given your size. And the other thing I said to him, you got a ticket home, because that looks serious. And uh, he just grinned at me and walked on back to get some medical help. That's the last time I ever saw him. K-E-M-M-E-R-E-R, Kemmerer. -E -R -E -R. I don't remember his first name. Yeah. So that was the first we had on that side. But we were engaged in firefights on that side of the, uh, almost immediately. I mean, talk to me about the firefights. I mean, what, what happens in that situation? What, what are you doing? <laughs> Just, where do you think there's uh, a soldier, a Japanese soldier, you fire in that direction. You a lot of times can't see, but you have good reason to think where they are. They don't come out and say, you know, here I am. Uh, Unless it's a bonsai. Uh, I never saw a bonsai myself. I never saw one. But, uh, yeah. Were there any other casualties on that side of, of the river? Immediately? Or just generally? Well, there were, but I don't think, we, I don't remember our platoon having, we may have very well have had some wounded. We, I don't think we had anybody killed. Uh, yeah. um, so from from that incident, where do you guys go from there? Well, straight south. We just fought our way. <clears throat> we ended up uh, in a day or two there, a day over a day or so. I don't remember how long it took. Uh, in a, kind of a gap. That was a road, and there's a rocky area on one side, and then we uh, and some of our people were on that side of the road, and uh, you know, several of us on the right side, and then off to the right was a, a uh, rock, very rocky hill. It was full of uh, caves, with Japanese soldiers in it, and. Uh, uh, Charlie Company of the 22nd, that would be 1st Battalion. They were to our immediate right. And <clears throat> so uh, we were told we were to stay here and let Charlie Company do their thing on that hill. Uh, and uh, we would uh, make sure that the, the Japanese did not come around and get behind them or come up and from the side. And that was really something to see because the Charlie Company fought there all night, all night long. They fought up there, and uh, <clears throat> they finally subdued that uh, hill. And uh, I just had a hearing aid go out. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so we but we so we were holding that area and uh, we started we didn't get uh, any kind of an attack there and so but we did get assaulted by uh, 
mortars, heavy mortars, and by uh, uh, artillery. And I think I, before we started, I told you a little story about uh, them spotting us. The, uh, Would you mind sharing that? That's hard. It's hard. Uh, <coughs> I, I, wouldn't ask, I wouldn't ask if I didn't think it was let, important. Let me try it. Let me try it. See. Uh, in order to protect ourselves from the Japanese coming at us, we use uh, the captain had us use a, a lot of flares. Uh, they, you know, lighted up the uh, sky, and uh, <clears throat> but I don't think that the, the Japanese the, in firing at us uh, knew exactly where we were. Uh, they couldn't tell by the flare at any rate. But, <clears throat> but what happened to us? Uh, an old Okinawan woman kept, was walking up that road in the middle of the night. And I could get, I could see her very very well. I was probably I don't know fifty sixty feet from her something like that. And she had a, a Okinawa tall walking stick that they use, usually about head higher or taller. And uh, it, I thought it was uh, dangerous to let her go because with the flare she saw where we were. She could. Didn't mean she did see us, but she could see us easily. And so uh, I think a lot of us, and I know I did, uh, thought maybe she better die. And so uh, I put my rifle up but I would have been an easy shot. I couldn't pull the trigger. I couldn't do it. And apparently, if the other guys did that, they didn't either, because she just kept right on hobbling along. And it wasn't, you know, maybe a half hour or so after that that, that uh, the artillery just rained in on us. Just, and it was exact, it went in, right into guys' foxholes and everything else. And it was a pretty horrendous thing. Uh, my good friend Dale Cox lost both of his legs uh, in that barrage. Uh, Bill Holloway was a good friend of mine. He lost one leg in that uh, barrage. Uh, it was a horrible night. Uh, before that, by the way, before that, was well, Charlie Hill kind of got subdued a little bit. And before that, our Tory barrage uh, I was tired. I was really tired. I don't know how long I'd been since I slept. It was a long time. And uh, so Padilla and I traded off. Uh, he'd be, you know, awake X number of hours, maybe three or two, and then we'd trade off. Each one tried to get a nap. In. <coughs> and uh, we did that a couple of times. And then apparently Padilla told me later he couldn't wake me up. He thought I was dead. <laughs> so I assured him I wasn't dead. But, uh, at any rate, he, uh, he, he was a good scout about it and he saw through my watch for me. You know. but, it, but of course that's easy to do if you think I'm dead. So. Uh, uh. Uh. Going back to that artillery barrage, yeah. can you put me in your shoes? I mean, describe to me what is it like to have these shells going off around you? Oh, well, it's hard to describe how, you know, it's terrifying. It is just simply so loud. You, you, and if they're coming in so, with so many of them coming in, there's a very good chance they're going to hit so close to you that the foxhole isn't going to do you any good. Well, so, but uh, all you can do is suck it up and try to get through the get through the whole thing. How do you protect yourself? You can't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<coughs> uh, no, you can't protect yourself against that. It's, it's too hard. How long would you say that barrage went on for? Three, four hours. Something like that. And, and then can you just explain the, the connection uh, between the old lady? Do you, I mean, do you, what is your personal belief? That she probably cited, told them where we were. Yeah. She probably told them. Who? It told the Japanese soldiers. Who did? The little old lady, yeah. I think she probably did. Because they were so exact. Yeah. And were, were any of the men killed in the barrage? Oh yeah, but I don't think I could come up with their names. Uh, the, see, I remember those two because I was so close to those guys. But they both o outside of my fire team, those two and a couple of other guys, about four guys, were really close friends of mine. Uh, Did you? Uh, I I I, I, I try sometimes to come up with a. You know, a name uh, after all these years, and I, and sometimes I can't come up with a name or a face. You know, I just, I just can't do it anymore. Do you remember just the number numbers wise how many were killed in that barrage? Because the two men you mentioned both survived, correct? In that barrage, no, I wouldn't want to venture a guess. But there were some killed? Oh yeah, had to be. Can you just say that then? That well, yeah, there had to be, have been quite a number of people that died in it. But uh, I don't really uh, know how many. Um, after this barrage, oh, you mentioned C Company fighting up on the, the hill. Second. C Company fighting up on that hill. C Company. Uh, but you mentioned that that was really something to see. What do you remember? I mean, could you actually see the firefights going on? Yeah, yeah, and flamethrowers. Oh, describe, describe to me, what did well, you see? Uh, Charlie Company it was, uh, ran into a lot of uh, bunkers and uh, ch chiseled right out of volcanic rock, out of volcanic rock, and caves carved right out of it. And I... Uh, 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 so it, that's fighting at night. Uh, you could see tracers, uh, machine gun tracers. Uh, you could see uh, flamethrower uh, being used uh, in in those bunkers and in those caves. That uh, and it's pitch. If it, if it wasn't for for those tracers and those those flamethrowers, you wouldn't be able to see anything. It was just pitch black. Uh, uh, Really, a dark night, very dark. So after the barrage, um, what happens to you all? Oh, well, you mean like in the morning? Well, we move forward, uh, and uh, we met some resistance. Uh, there were some bunkers that uh, put grenades in, and. Uh, uh, we read, started encountering uh, uh, a lot of knee mortars. Uh, do you know what a knee mortar is? Pretend I don't. Okay, well, a knee mortar was a, not a very effective Japanese weapon in World War II. Uh, <clears throat> it was kind of like a tube, and there was a platform on the bottom that was shaped like it would fit around your knee. And then the Japanese would drop <clears throat> a mortar shell into that, and uh, they were very small, and they, they generally they weren't very effective. But that doesn't mean that they weren't dangerous at all. And uh, for, that and it also means that these people were not in bunkers or something because you can't fire a mortar of any size in, in, from inside uh, a bunker or. A, uh, any kind of a uh, protective uh, area. 
So uh, <clears throat> we did get one casualty, a serious one, uh, from a name order. So the name order tended to, uh, when it lands, it tended to, the explosion goes pretty much straight up. So unless, you know, it's really close to an individual, it, it may not hurt them very seriously at all. And uh, <clears> there <throat> will be some flex will come out the side, uh, but uh, not, uh, not a lot. But we had, a, we had a guy who was a really good man. His name was uh, Johnson. And don't ask me his first name because we always called him Old Man. Old Man Johnson because he was 29 years old. Was married, had two kids in Missouri, uh, and was a terrific person. Uh, after the war, he made a point of uh, coming to see me in Ames, and like my other previous experience, I wasn't there, but he stopped and talked to my mom and and, uh, and told her stories about uh, the things we had done and made her cry. So, but that was that was a couple of years later. So. At any rate, uh, uh, Johnson got a knee motor exploded right down at his uh, feet, and, it, and he was kind of bending over, and the uh, the uh, fragments from the knee uh, knee mortar blinded him. Uh, he still had when they got out of the hospital. I understand that he still had some sight in in one eye but uh, no sight in the other eye at all. Uh, I picked up a couple little flicks from that too, but that wasn't anything. What do you mean flicks? L little pieces of shrapnel. That kind of, it was, wasn't anything serious at all. It was like having a bad, a bad and hard sliver. Oh. <laughs> wasn't much. Little tiny things too. Yeah. Not anything that would require a, a, a major surgery or something. Yeah. Yeah. And just to go back a little bit, can you uh, talk to me more about the grenades in the bunker? Yeah. Uh, so explain to me what, what happened. Well, there, there were uh, s small bunkers that uh, we encountered that looked like they would hold maybe three, four guys. Who? Japanese soldiers. You know? And we would, uh, when we encountered those, uh, uh, we would just put a grenade in it, whether we saw anybody or not. And we didn't try to look in there. So, and uh, so th that would uh, clear that area uh, for a safe passage for us to go by. The, uh, when Shafto got out of the hospital after the war and came to see me, uh, he embarrassed me by telling my family how I almost uh, blew my leg off. I dropped a grenade in and uh, there's an aperture where I just threw it in there. And then I walked back. I knew I had about five seconds and I just stepped over to the side. Then I decided I got time. I'll go back over the other. So I went back and over and it went off and my own, own hand grenade uh, blew some shrapnel right through my dungaree pants. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do that again. Yeah. Were there other times that you used grenades in combat? No, I don't remember ever using it. I may have, but I don't remember. Besides yeah. that time? Yeah. Now, I, I tried to use, a, they, they have a, a, it's kind of a rifle grenade. And uh, I, I was going to use that one time, but uh, I, that went sour. I had to, I think, uh, place the launch on my rifle. But you needed a special cartridge to launch it, and uh, I couldn't find that darn launch. I couldn't find that launching cartridge, so I didn't. So I didn't use it, obviously. No. No. 
so I was not a perfect Marine. I don't know if there is such a thing. Yeah. So can you talk to me about Well, after Old Man Johnson gets hit, what happens to you all? Uh, well, I don't remember. I'm getting my days together now. I know that at some point they're there the next day. Uh, we're starting to, well, we've, for a day and a half, we've got Charlie Hill. That that period, where at that point we're only, you know, two to three hundred yards from Sugar Hill. So not, but we didn't know it was Sugar Hill. I mean, we didn't give it that name. Some officers upstairs gave it that name, uh, and we hadn't seen that hill yet when we were when we were in that um, next to to uh, Charlie Company there. A day or so later, after the knee mortar thing incidents, that's what we had. Uh, Mr. Roos, President uh, Lieutenant Roos, had me uh, be the lead for the platoon, uh, and so we kind of formed a V and went up a ridge. And but this time, even though we didn't know about Sugarloaf Hill, it was just off to our left. And I went up, we went up that ridge, and to my utter amazement, there was a giant city the other side of that ridge. It was Naha, the capital city. I was astonished. And uh, I thought we would just keep going right on down into Naha. Uh, the Japanese had other plans. Uh, and that didn't work out. So, so we came back down that ridge, and we no more got back down that ridge than uh, Captain Stebbins. I, I remember him talking, so I, I don't know why I was as close to him and, to hear that. But he said that the boys from our EC company, E company, are having a lot of trouble down at that hill over there. And uh, we, we're going down there and we're going to, uh, going to assist, assist them. So they kind of left me uh, in that same position I was, point people fanned out actually a whole company behind. You know? And then we just started down by that ridge on the ridges on the right Sugar overhead in a road. On the other side of the road was a very shallow ditch. Not that I noticed that right away, but as, and as we just started out, uh, we hit uh, a, a tremendous fire from the Japanese. Uh, the Nambu machine gun or machine guns, I don't know, never did know whether it was one or whether it was more than that. I have a feeling it was more than that. It just decimated our platoon. We immediately had uh, 30, probably 30 casualties. I'm guessing a little there. Uh, deaths, wounded. Uh, my fire team, all three went down. I didn't. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, that's uh, what happened. And I took, uh, uh, I looked to my right, and uh, right rear, and uh, there was a fellow in our platoon named uh, Hank uh, Kasica. From, uh, Hank was from uh, New Jersey, and he was in death rows. And uh, I looked there after I looked at my fire team, and Shafto was, the BAR man was down. The other two guys were hurt, hurting, especially uh, Padilla. And uh, you know, I don't think I'd do for Kasica, but I uh, got those guys to get into that shallow ditch on the other side of that road. 
and uh, it gave, uh, especially uh, I worked trying hard to help help Shaftel because he was in a lot of pain. He'd been shot to the chest, some other place I can't remember. And uh, he had a, uh, we'd been said that if you get a, a lung wound, a chest wound, uh, take first aid kit and kind of spindle it. Uh, and then just try to shove that in the, in the hole so that uh, it helps maintain the, the ability to breathe, maybe. And uh, I had a, I was push, <laughs> pushing hard on him to do that. And uh, they saw, Japanese apparently saw me in all that activity and they fired at us with that Nambu again and hit Shafto again. Uh, broke his arm, and now he was in a lot of pain, and he was still had a sense of humor. He told me that he didn't think he could use any more first aids, <laughs> uh, so to kind of leave him alone. So I, I, I just took my rifle and I fired. Uh, I could see the aperture where at least one machine gun was. And I fired into that, and they fired back. And uh, that went on for quite a while. And uh, but I, before the before it went on quite a while, I I don't remember. I guess it was right after I gave first aid to to Shafto and uh, the other guys that I realized that we were alone. <laughs> well, there was nobody, no Marines around. Everybody was gone, and we and we couldn't move. We couldn't get out of it. We had to stay in that ditch, uh, and it was way too shallow to be safe. And uh, eventually, uh, Lieutenant Roos, I could recognize his voice, and he shouted from off in the distance from there that. Uh, he was going to try to get a tank to come up and uh, fire on any of those Nambu apertures that it saw there. And, uh, but this forest to hang tough out there. So, so we did. In other words, we were trapped. There was a, a fifth person with us, but I have no recollection whatsoever as to who, who he was. Fifth Marine, I mean. Uh, um, so that was my uh, introduction to Sugar Hill. From your position, can you just explain where were all the Japanese uh, no, defensive positions? No, I couldn't positions? see anything. It's just a few apertures. But, but when you say apertures, do you mean apertures in a bunker or just a little hole? No, in, the, in, uh, uh, in uh, the hill. And in the in that ridge I was talking about, where the ridge and the hill came together, <coughs> you couldn't tell anything, and uh, that was. Uh, but it wasn't like a big, uh, like how there, uh, you know, when there's a bunker, they have a whole big wide aperture that they can fire. Yeah, ap aperture, would, may, I don't know, it may have been this big. Yeah. Okay. But. You know, it was it was disguised. A lot of them were disguised. You couldn't see them. The apertures were maybe this big, and uh, were uh, camouflaged. You couldn't really tell much about it where they were. Uh, it was a, apparently a very elaborate defensive skill uh, that's, that they had set up. And and how high would you say Sugarloaf was? Pardon? How high was it? The uh, hill? How high? Sugar Wolf? Yeah. How tall was Sugar Wolf? Yeah. Well, I'm not. I'm at the base. When I'm telling this story, I'm at the base of Sugar Wolf. I'm not on the. Uh, well, I climb. Nowadays, I hike hills that high. It isn't very high. Uh, it's fairly steep. But let me tell you right up 
And this is a peculiarity that I've wondered about from time to time through the years. Uh, first of all, it, I didn't try to go up there right away. <laughs> you wouldn't have made it anyway. But I did make it eventually, a day or so later. I don't remember how long. I have no recollection whatsoever of going to the top of the hill, but I did. I did make it. And I, 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 I don't know why. I, th I think maybe, see, back at the base later, after the incident that I talked about on another time, uh, there were about five of us left in the platoon. And one of them was Mr. Roos. Lieutenant Roos. Lieutenant Roos was, uh, had already been wounded. It was not terribly serious. Uh, in fact, he came over and sat down on the edge of the foxhole with me when he was wounded. And he showed me, he, he's a big man, and he had big, meaty hands. And he showed me a hand, and I don't remember his left one or his right one, but the meat of the hand, you could have put a pencil right through the hole where he, where he had been shot. And I said, why don't you go back and get that taken care of? And he said, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going. And uh, at any rate, so later after that event and, uh, with the uh, Nambus at the base of uh, of Sugarloaf. We were still at the base of the Sugarloaf. There were about five of us left. And uh, I don't know who called for it, but somebody with a primitive communication system we had called for a tank. Uh, and that tank came and went out there. We did call for it, didn't ask for it. The tank got out sort of far end of Sugarloaf, and I said, that's really dangerous for them because the Japanese could come. Uh, there's any number of things they could do, throw gasoline on it. Uh, we, nobody there to protect them. And uh, Lieutenant Roos, uh, I think I said, I think I said, do you, do you want me to see? They, there was no communication. The tank had a had a box on the back with a telephone. So you had, if you wanted to communicate with those guys, you had to go to the tank and talk. I said, you want me to go out over there? And it was, I bet it was 50 yards or more there, and, and tell them that uh, they better back off because we can't give them any protection. He said, no, no. I think I said that. I know for a fact he said, I'm going to go take talk to him. And I'm going to go tell him to back up. And uh, Lieutenant Roos went, went out there. I saw him buckle a couple of times. So he'd been hit. And he had uh, got that phone off and he talked to the tank commander. And then when he came back, he uh, got hit again. So that would be about the third, third hit, I think, that he took. And he, uh, uh, he made it all the way back to where I was. And uh, we got a, a medic, by the way, when I said, I cannot say enough about our our Navy corpsman. He was terrific, terrific guy, and I can't even remember his name now. But I remember the one from Guam. I remember his name, but I don't remember this guy. Anyway, he uh, uh, he tended to uh, Lieutenant Roos and and uh, got a vehicle to take him, but he died. And, didn't survive. Did he say anything to you when he came back? Uh, 
He wouldn't up to it. No. No. He was a great natural leader of men. And, and he could, I would have guessed that had he lived, if, if whether he was in business or education or politics or whatever he'd done, he would have really been good at it because he, uh, he was good at understanding the people who uh, were, so to speak, under him. You know, one of my favorite stories about him was on Guadalcanal. Uh, Remember I told you that uh, a guy, Palladino, in my fire team was illiterate? Well, we were having a training thing on, on uh, compasses and maps and stuff. And so after he explained some things, the lieutenant explained some things, he called on Palladino to explain it. He didn't understand a word of it. He couldn't read it, couldn't read a map. Yeah. And so I told, I told our squad leader, a guy named Blondick, Blondick's from Massachusetts, told Blondick that Palatino's illiterate. He, he can't read or write. He doesn't know. I can't answer those questions. And uh, Lieutenant Roos didn't know it. He didn't know it at all. So quietly, uh, he, he was really mad at, at uh, Lieutenant Russo was really angry with Palladino. He was letting him have it, you know, pay attention, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so uh, after I talked to uh, Bondic, Bondic went up and told him, did he say a letter? Yeah. He said, oh my God. And he said, Morgan, you and Palladino go uh, someplace he sent us, I don't know. And then when I got back, uh, Bondic said that the, the uh, Roos apologized to the whole platoon for stupidity and not realizing that one of his men couldn't read. And then he said, he bent over, Roos did, he bent over and grabbed his own ankles with his hands and had Bondic kick him right in the butt in front of the whole platoon. Yeah. I mean, how many officers would do that? Because so, he said he should have known that, and that he was negligent in not knowing him well enough to, that that's kind of a guy he was. How um, old was he when he was killed? 28. 28 years old. He's from uh, New Jersey. And in his Navy cross citation, it talks about him firing at the enemy. Oh yeah. Have you read his Navy cross? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 He did. Yeah. He, he's, he's all over the place. Yeah. He he did that. But see, but the Navy cross. You know, those guys write those things. They flower right up. Right? They were where I was. You know, it's like, uh, like that business of uh, of us being uh, trapped. You know, I saw a report one time about that, and it was we, we, <laughs> it was all wet. Wait, so, so going back to your story, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So when you and your fire team, plus that one other Marine, were at the base of Sugarloaf, what happened to no, you? No, we were, we were fairly close, yeah. Yes, we so, were fairly close. So can you tell me? We, we may have been, by that time, we may have been uh, 75 yards from Sugarloaf. So, so but, but what happened to you? So after all these guys got cut down around you yeah. from the Nambu machine gun fire, then what happened? Well, that's when I was trapped. Yeah, that's what. And, and, the, and the, the the rest of the people who were wounded got out of there and and uh, just left the area with medical help and so forth. 
and, and the people who weren't hurt were helping those that were hurt. And, uh, and we were just left out there. So then what happened to you guys? Well, they did, uh, uh, they did get a tank to come up and um, close that one Nambu area. I had seen it. I could see that where that was coming from. And I had fired into it myself. But, uh, and then as soon as they did that, we didn't get any more fire for a little while. <laughs> we got plenty later. Well, if you die very suddenly, you know, the nervous system is going crazy. You know, it's like that. And it stops in a, in a minute or two. Uh, so yeah, Hank was, it was in the death throes. Uh, yeah. And what do you remember about him? What kind of a Marine was he? Uh, not a very good one. He, he didn't like being there and he complained a lot. Uh, yeah. He he wasn't a very popular guy with the platoon, and the platoon is really close, really close. I are you, you, I know you know this, but uh, you know the book and the TV series. I know. The I didn't Pacific. See the TV series, Band of Brothers. Yeah, the, but they so, also. I mean that, that is really true. Yeah. And, they, you, they could talk about us being patriotic and out there for mother and God and country, but what you're really out there for is to take care of your buddies and they take care of you. It's absolutely true. So it's, it's patriotic stuff's all real nice. Just in combat, you don't think one thing about it. It's just spread out protecting the guy next to you. Yeah, and he's taking care of you. Um. And, and, and you know, you know, like uh, of the of my fire team, of those three guys, the only one of those three that I would normally in civilian life have much anything to do with is Padilla. Is Padilla, and I shared a, a lot of I think same values and and. Uh, even though I never met a Mexican before, I don't even know if I knew a Catholic, you know, and so forth. But uh, we were brothers, and and Shafto was our brother, and Padilla was our brother. Well, the only place I really did just kind of standard patrols was on Guam, when I was in the. Jungles of the north end of the island, uh, looking for Japanese stragglers. Uh -huh. On Okinawa, we didn't patrol, we went in force. What would you say was the closest you got to the Japanese infantry in a firefight? 35 feet. And where was that? Okinawa. Uh, <laughs> I was, <clears throat> that was when we were attempting to uh, uh, get down to uh, Easy Company that was already on Sugar Row Field. And we were fired on by Japanese machine guns and rifle fire. And it was very close. That's the incident where your fire team got hit? Is that yeah. what you were talking about? Same event. Okay. Were there that, any... Ex that's the closest we got. Were there any experiences you had uh, firing? I mean, because those Japanese were dug in in those uh, positions. Did you guys have any open fire fights where they were up above ground and so were you? No, they were always disguised really well. Yeah. They were uh, in, a bunk in uh, bunkers or in uh, caves or in, uh, in uh, tombstones, Hakodama tombstones. Uh, and, uh, but mostly behind 
large emplacements, defensive emplacements of near Sugar Hill. And that ridge that ran uh, north of uh, north of Anaha. There's a question of having the firepower. Uh, if you get everyone firing into a dark shaded area, uh, and, and the, uh, someone has some officer or other person has a good reason to think uh, that there's an emplacement there, a defensive emplacement, or that there are soldiers. Japanese soldiers uh, uh, <clears throat> that have placed themselves in uh, uh, a brush or in a disguised camouflaged area or something like that uh, to uh, fire into it. And that was really true at the top of, of uh, Sugarloaf because you were kind of looking slightly down and uh, Lieutenant Bear who became well, he, be, he was a ex company executive officer when Captain Stebbins was badly wounded. Uh, he took command of the company, not that there was much company there anymore. But uh, uh, <clears throat> he, this is an incredible story. Uh, I was fascinated even then about it, let alone thinking about it. Lieutenant Bear <clears throat> picked up a regular 30 caliber machine gun. Not a submachine gun, but a real machine gun. Not, of course, the heavy. Uh, and <clears throat> he cradled it in his arm like this and used it like he was firing from a hip. And he would fire off in a direction with tracers, which would show us the target that he wanted us to be shooting at. And he did a lot of that. And that... <laughs> That 30 caliber machine gun, you know, it, it's not the one with a big water tank around it. It's the one with a little narrow uh, air uh, protected on it. And it, it burned right through his dungaree jacket into his arm, but he just kept firing like that. So he, he was a, another amazing officer we had. Did he survive? He survived. He was badly wounded, but he was survived, yes. And uh, he and Major Courtney, Major Courtney took over to the battalion, which, like the company, was kind of non-existent at that time. And uh, Major uh, Courtney was doing similar kinds of kinds of things. Uh, Major Courtney was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his work on Chicago. He was our battalion commander. But, uh, well, what could he do as a battalion commander that would have earned him the Medal of Honor? Wouldn't he have been pretty far back? Uh, well, he just refused to g give up ground to the Japanese when they when they attacked, and uh, and and then what he did was he organized with only twenty men left. He organized an attack on the Japanese. Is not something that I would have done, uh, but uh, he did, and he paid the ultimate price. Well, that was a tremendous amount of courage that yeah. this man had. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Did you see him at all, or did you ever meet him? Oh yeah, sure. He, my battalion commander, even though my battalion was down to about. 35, 40, 50 guys, I mean, there wasn't very many left. Yeah. Uh, see, and after he did that, see, and then I was gone uh, when he decided to do that. And the, the uh, division commander, General Shepard, moved the 29th Regiment in. The entire, it was a fresh regiment, moved the 29th Regiment in to replace us on Sugarloaf, which we had maintained. And, and when you mentioned that you were gone when your battalion commander was killed, where were you at that point? In Mob 8, on the way to Mob 8 or in Mob 8. Okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll get to that, but um, before we go back to Sugarloaf, just some more general questions about sure. your time on Okinawa. 
Um, did you have any experiences against the Japanese planes? Were you guys ever strafed by the Japanese fighter planes? Never. Did you have complete air control? The only thing that I saw peculiar was on that very first night on Okinawa. Remember, I told you I was on Yantan Airport. We dug foxholes there, and the Navy uh, was out there in full force still. You know, they didn't go away. All those battleships and cruisers and destroyers and all kinds of uh, rocket ships and so forth were out there. <coughs> and a lot of them, there were a lot, there was a lot of anti-aircraft stuff going. So when a Japanese uh, a Zero or a uh, Kamikaze would come in, I saw a Kamikaze come in, and uh, they, uh, the Navy did not take that lightly. They really put up a lot of firepower for that. Uh, one, that first night though, I was dumbfounded. Do you know what, a, I don't know if you recognize it, the name, but the, the, the Japanese had a bomber called a Betty Bomber. And a Betty Bomber, where we were looking, flew into all that fire that was going up there. And I could not believe it. It was, that thing was a mile or more wide. Maybe, I'm sure it was more wider than that. And it flew out the other side. I don't know how I ever got through that thing. That was just amazing. I'm sure they didn't survive somebody, fighter plane or somebody probably got them, but I, I just watched that with fascination. That I thought, sure, that plane is gonna come down. Mostly when it was in there, that uh, <clears throat> in that firing, uh, I couldn't see it at all. But there it came, it came out the left side of it. So it's really, really strange. Do you ever see any other kind of kamikaze attacks? I, I saw one uh, a kamikaze attack a ship. Uh, and uh, it, it didn't make it to the ship. It, it came in, it came down in low, and it dove straight for a, it was either a destroyer, it must have been a destroyer it went after, because it wasn't a really large ship. But he, he got nailed before he made it, exploded. Yeah. Um, talk to me about your experiences with, or, or, or can, you, can you describe to me, what do you remember about the Okinawan tombs? And can you explain the whole culture behind that? No, I, I can't really accept that they, uh, the Okinawans uh, <clears throat> uh, had quite a reference for their ancestors. And uh, they would place uh, little bowls of, of rice and food and sake drink and so forth. Uh, at the outside those tombs, I suppose birds and evaporation took care of them, and I think they thought maybe they had been eaten by their ancestors. I don't know. Uh, but the Japanese uh, and Okinawans were really not considered Japanese by the Japanese standards. Uh, and the uh, uh, Japanese uh, committed kind of a sacrilege by sometimes making those, using those as a uh, as a defensive placement for machine guns and so forth to shoot at us. Yeah. Were there times that you encountered Japanese emplacements in those tombs? Uh, the, oh, shortly after we crossed the Asakawa River, we did have that happen. And yeah. what do you remember about that? But that's the only time I saw it. Yeah. What do you remember about that incident? Uh, we did not demolish it. I know that. If somebody else may have, but uh, we didn't. We just went around it. But somebody had to take care of that, so I'm sure it was. But it wasn't the George Company. One fellow that was killed, us, uh, I don't remember his name now. He was a very quiet guy, uh, pleasant enough. He never wanted to talk. 
He had been with the 22nd in the Marshall Islands at Anahuitac. He had been with the 22nd at Guam, and he got sent for a medical thing or something, and he came back to the George Company, and uh, his squad mates, or one of them, or somebody in the squad told, him, told me that he said uh, that he'd been through a lot in those two operations and that he would not survive the next one. And he didn't. But for the life of me, I can't remember that fellow's name. But do you remember how he was killed? Oh, in rifle fire. Rifle fire, yeah. Can you tell me about some of the times that you really, besides the ones we've talked about, but are there any other times you know, other close calls that you had that you thought you might not make it, other than what we've talked about already. No, but that was a kind of a constant, constant thing. After we crossed the Asakawa River, you were never away from. You know, very few light spells. <laughs> It was a, uh, it was pretty heavy duty thinking. Uh, that's why you don't sleep and why you don't eat and why you don't drink. And it's it's uh, it's difficult, very difficult. No, that one. Was, you could get, you know like Colonel Woodhouse was our our. Uh, battalion commander, and um, one second he was there, and one second he was a sniper. He was gone. So, you don't have a, you don't have a, a, a recess in combat. Sometimes, the Japanese used a, a fairly low caliber rifle. Uh, 25 mil, and uh, <clears throat> it made a singing sound more than our our rifle, the, the, more than our bullets did. And uh, at times it, it was almost like a chorus, a just all over the place. Uh, it uh, was not reassuring at all. Oh, I couldn't even begin to name how many times I got shot at. Many, many, many. Very lucky to be here. Yeah. Um, were there times that you provided first aid to some of the wounded men around you? Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, when my fire team was in, I gave first aid to them. Those three guys, mm -hmm. especially the Shafto, because he was really badly hurt, and uh, unfortunately, my uh, efforts were not appreciated by the Japanese soldiers. They saw me moving around, and they let fire at me, missed me, and hit Shafto. But uh, they didn't hit Padilla, or they didn't hit Paladino, fortunately. And that was with a machine gun, not a rifle. Uh, uh, that was the, the principal time that I gave first aid. Were there other times? No, I don't think probably, but I got people uh, help from the, from a medic or something like that. You know. In fact, that was my kind of my swan song on Sugar Hill. You know. I, was, I was pretty well washed up. And I thought I was the only platoon member left. I can't, couldn't have been more than 30 left on the hill, on top of the hill. And uh, I, I ran across, I was moving from one place to another, or trying to, and I ran across uh, another friend, Mike Hannigan, my first Irish-American friend from Boston. And uh, Mike was badly, badly wounded. 
he had been shot right through the right through the chest, and uh, so I got down and I was going to try to give him first aid. And I, it was way beyond me, and I didn't have the skills for that. And uh, I called for uh, our medic and a corpsman, and, and he came and he tagged uh, tagged up uh, Mike, and uh, I couldn't get up. I, I was down on the ground with him. I couldn't get up. And uh, so he, he uh, Corman said, well, you take, take Mike, go back with Mike to the hospital. So I, so I did. And uh, got back there and uh, I was back about an hour and I asked about Mike and the nurse said, uh, he, I said, I explained what I'd seen. Uh, uh, my man shot through the chest, and when he exhaled, these huge blood bubbles would ex go out of his mouth and his nose. And uh, I, I told her that I saw that and so forth, and she either checked on him or something, and she told me he wasn't going to make it. But I, when I retired in '94, I found evidence that he did. But I, you know, I don't really know. Well, I think just that there was a Mike Hannigan in that little town in Massachusetts that he was from or something like that. I don't think it was very, uh, very, uh, very convincing evidence. But, oh, and also I think I must have searched uh, records or something to see if he had, it's unlisted as dead. Oh, and he wasn't. Well, I don't. I think I didn't find him. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was a fun guy. He was very Irish. <coughs> he was a second generation Irish, of course. But he, was he was he, he was, saying anything to you when you found him? He couldn't talk. He couldn't talk. He was having struggle, struggling with breathing. Even. Uh, uh, there could, uh, after we're done, I'll try to find out if he's still around. How old? How old was he? He's older than me. So I, I would guess he was probably about twenty-four at that time. That means he so would he'd be, be really old. No, he wouldn't be really old. That means he'd be born in twenty if he was twenty-four. Um, yeah. So that would just mean he's 98. So can you talk to me about uh, your living conditions in combat? Can you explain, describe that to me? Well, you're exposed to the elements for one thing, which sometimes when it's a cold rain in particular, it's not very much, not very much fun to be there. Uh, 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 the food was uh, sea rations. Uh, and they they came in just little silvery cans, with a with a little key to unscrew it and so forth. Uh, and then of course your canteen for water. Uh, I got so uh, I would say from the Asakawa River on, I. I probably didn't eat or drink anything at all, uh, in my case. I can't speak for anybody else. But, uh, didn't have an appetite. Why? Uh, too emotional. Uh, too difficult. But I don't think I thought about it much either. And I don't think I was hungry. I don't think I was felt thirsty. But it, uh, I was. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I got back to the hospital with Mike, and uh, uh, doctors looked at me and kept me. Uh, I ate some square meals, thinking I was going to go back up, but after I'd eaten square meals, I weighed 117 pounds. Um, I went into Okinawa probably 142, something like that. 
and uh, after the war, my my grandpa Morgan died. Believe it or not, this is relevant. <laughs> he died. Uh, he was a big, robust man, six. And when he died, he before he died, he was before he was sick. He was about two thirty-five, maybe something like that. In his prime, probably two twenty. And uh, uh, his weight got down to. Uh, he had a stroke. His weight went down to 115 and he died. And so I read about that because my grandmother said that's kind of a doctor's kind of a magic number for the system just collapsing. And I said, no, I did read that when I looked into it. So I guess they thought my system was going to <laughs> might collapse. Uh, so they kept me in, and I was there just a couple of days, and they had me flown to uh, Bob 103 at, uh, in Guam. And I had a picture of myself. What's a mob? Uh, a, a mob is a, a mobile, a, a naval mobile hospital. Uh, so that kind of ended my combat career there. Yeah. So, just more general questions here. Can you tell me about, um, do you have any experiences against Japanese booby traps? No, I don't remember seeing it. If, uh, on the edge of Naha, I would have been placed to see one, and in that town I mentioned earlier, I think to you, uh, Nago, uh, that would have been an ideal place for booby traps. Because I broke into a, a number of houses at Nago, and I never got booby trapped. I had, I had one really strange experience there, if you want to hear it. I broke into this house looking for Japanese soldiers that might be there. We were ostensibly there just for the purpose of, of protecting uh, uh, the flank of uh, the 4th Regiment had gone up a peninsula there. And uh, I w when I was a teenage kid at home, I was kind of a fan of uh, teenage Shirley Temple. Um, and I went into this house and it had little tiny rooms. And one of the little tiny rooms the, every wall was pasted from floor to ceiling with Shirley Temple pictures. Solid. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> That's one of the other bizarre things besides the officer and condoms. <laughs> so uh, Your war experience could be summed up in three words. Condoms, officer, Shirley Temple. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, strange. And uh, did you find any but, Japanese? But, you know, but you no, I didn't find any. In none of the houses? No, no, they were. But I didn't find people. There were no civilians there either. So they were all gone. I hiding someplace from my vicious Americans. So, uh, yeah, there were. Uh, I understand that people go to visit Okinawa now and they take tours there and they still tell you how bad we were. Uh, it makes me feel bad. But their stories are probably accurate. Well, I doubt some, it. Some of, the, some of those things probably really did happen. But, uh, what makes you say that? Well, there were civilians killed for no reason. Did you hear about this or you saw this? I saw it. I saw an elderly Okinawan couple gunned to death. Not by us, but by uh, guys from another unit. Yeah. What was the reason? I, there was no reason. They did it to do it, because they could. Were you guys in the middle of a firefight? 
Um, no, it was sort of between artillery shellings. And maybe they were ticked off or something when they did that. Some call for. Now there, there were some, you know, like when I was on Guadalcanal, we were on Guadalcanal, there were a few Japanese prisoners that we saw, but the army had them uh, and confined. Uh, there weren't very many, maybe a dozen, something like that. Uh, I saw, I personally saw no Japanese prisoners on Okinawa or Guam. You saw no prisoners taken? I saw no, yeah. They didn't give up. Can you describe the hatred that you would say the Marines had for the Japanese? Or, or, or not maybe hatred, but describe the animosity that you all had for the enemy, please. Well, I think it started with a disdain more than a hatred. Uh, although it was uh, easy to express orally, uh, in terms of hatred, you could you hear heard stuff like that, and people said it. Probably said it myself. I'm embarrassed to remember it, but But once you get in combat, and once your, your folks get killed and hurt, then it's pretty easy to generate hatred. You know, it's really kind of silly because they're doing the same thing the other way. Because you know, uh, it's that band of brothers thing. You know, they, they hurt my brother or they killed my brother. And uh, I began to change a little bit on Guam about that kind of thing. Uh, I, I didn't cure myself, but on Guam, uh, this, uh, there was a cave pretty close to Agate Beach there. And, uh, it, uh, Japanese soldiers in a cave, in that cave, and they uh, they got the napalm treatment. And there's one guy, I didn't see this personally, but guy ran out on fire. And, uh, and uh, I was there very shortly after that. And I, they killed him, it was almost like a mercy killing because he was burning to death. And uh, I was very curious about seeing him there. And I did something I didn't do very often. But I, I looked at his wallet. I wasn't trying to get rich. I was just looking at it. And he had two pictures in the wall. One was an older, uh, older man and an older woman. Probably no doubt his. Parents. And then there was one individual picture, which would have been his sister or maybe a sweetheart. Uh, and they looked like <laughs> such nice people. <laughs> and I just uh, it started me thinking you know, about that. And then things like that, that Shirley Temple room, you know, there's somebody that appreciates something that I appreciate, you know. So, it, it didn't turn me around overnight. I was a Marine and I had a job to do, but I didn't think about stuff like that. That maybe they aren't as different yeah. than we, as we think they are. Yeah. Then I, uh, you know, after, the, after the war, I went to graduate school. And, uh, that was some time after the war. In the University of Iowa, and working on my master's. And there was a Japanese fellow in a, a little graduate seminar in history. And uh, he, he was a little bit younger than I, but uh, he was from Japan. He 
He wasn't Japanese American, he was Japanese. And he was the nicest guy. And we talked a lot about history and so on and so forth. And I, you know, I remember thinking very clearly, boy, just a few years ago, we would have been trying to kill each other. And it really was, uh, had an impact on me. And a few years after that, I, I was teaching community college in San Diego. I had a lady in my class, she was Nisi, and she spent uh, World War II in a camp. And, uh, in a tournament? So, yeah, I would talk to her about that. And uh, she, she said we're having a, a, a celebration at our temple. Why don't you and your family come? I did it, you know. I took her and my two kids. We went and she was there. She was so happy to see me there with my family. And uh, so you know, just through the years, I, I began to grow up a little bit. By the time I was teaching and uh, had been being an administrator at a state university in California, uh, one of my best friends and colleagues on the faculty was a, a guy named Shigail Kanda. That's not Irish. <laughs> uh, he spent, uh, he was younger than that lady, but he spent his childhood in the internment. Uh, so I, like America, I've kind of slowly evolved. You know? So now I'm about as close to a pacifist as you can be without being one. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, I, thought, I thought that was very beautifully said. Uh, especially about the the picture uh, and the wallet in the Shirley Temple room that really brings it home. Yeah. See. Yeah. And I think that would be a really nice thing for future people to to see. You know what your experience is. You know here you go fighting them to becoming friends with them. Not the same ones obviously, but the same people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not all Japanese are bad. But there are definitely some that were definitely bad, that's for sure. You know, some of the leaders and everything. Well, it's, it's just the other side of the coin that I'm talking about, a war being immoral and conducted by amoral young people. I mean, their young people are pretty flexible. You can mold them, you get them to believe things. Besides that, they have the physical stamina for war. And... Uh, so they're the ideal ones to uh, to uh, involve in those kinds of hostilities. And there's a lot of what, what ifs, even about you. I mean, you've pointed out some good things about World War II and tyrants. Uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> Japanese imperial government, and it's really a military government. Uh, Hitler's government, Mussolini's government. Uh, and all that's very true. But if you go back a little bit further, maybe if the world's policies had been a little more reasonable, would those, those kinds of people wouldn't have arisen to power in those countries. So we just did, you know, we're not thinking ahead, we're a little short of being omniscient, I'm afraid. Uh, so can you tell me, um, when you came home from the war, Talk to me about the difficulties that you had readjusting to civilian life. Yeah, I, 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 I had problems. Uh, however, I, I never thought about them as being like a social problem. It was just my problem. I, and then I had to try to deal with it. And uh, I... I I went back to school, that was good, I, but I was sometimes pretty erratic because I uh, was unsettled and thinking about this and that, and did I do the right thing or the wrong thing, meaning the war. And also uh, adaptation wasn't very easy because, it, well, you better go back to school because frankly there weren't any jobs, you know. 
16 million people just came back into the job market all of a sudden. <laughs> And a lot of them had a lot better qualifications than some 19-year-old kid that just got out of the ring where So school was it, which was a blessing. That, that was a wonderful company, the GIPO. I got paid to go to school, uh, but uh, I was uh, a little inconsistent. Eventually it worked out, though. And uh, there were some social things. Uh, this is a crazy one, but in fact, I've got a letter from... Padilla, it might have been with that letter. After the war, there, there were uh, still no cars. It took them a long time to start building cars. If they had built a lot of cars, they still couldn't have bought one because they didn't have the money for it. But th this seems kind of bizarre that I would even have worried about this or that we're not unhappy with it. <laughs> but, but, <clears throat> I had written a letter to Padilla telling him that uh, everything was going right. I was in school for it. I think I, that's what I told him. However, I'm having girl trouble. And the reason I'm having girl trouble was true. There's a girl might go out with you once, but probably not. But they won't go to you very go out with you very long if you don't have a car. Uh, I don't have a car, and I have to get one. And if, if I did, I couldn't afford one because the prices on them were really high because they were scarce. And uh, so he he wrote back and just said, "Be patient. Everything will work." <laughs> you know, sort of fatherly advice, I guess. But. Uh, you know, that really bothered me, as I, I wanted to, uh, you don't have to tell her that. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, it was, uh, it looks back, now looking back on it, it seems kind of funny. But it wasn't funny to me at that time. No, I mean, you wanted to be able to date, you wanted and to be able to mix move in. around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Here you had gone off, I think the big issue is, that you had already, you had gone across the world, you had done all these adult things, you know, you had fought in a war and everything, but here you are, you're, it's like you're a kid again, you can't even get around. You got it exactly. That is exactly what the issue was. You know, you know and even if you went out with a you girl, know, I had a girlfriend when I first got back, but frankly, she turned out, she was a nice girl, I think, you know, she's dead now, but. She was a very pretty girl, and she was nice. Uh, but it became uh, real evident to me that she was kind of showing me off as the guy that just got back from the Pacific. You know, it was, I was a, 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 a social icon, so to speak, not a real person. Oh, that didn't last very long. Uh, oh, and, and uh, she and others, you know, they, well, they wanted to party and dance and so forth. And I was still thinking about, I'm, God, I'm still alive. <laughs> yeah. That's, and some other guys aren't. So I wrote, what, I corresponded with Padilla. I corresponded for a while, probably longer than the other guys. I corresponded with uh, uh, a Fullerton guy. A little bit. I uh, wrote with um, Holiday I wrote longer. I kind of screwed that one up. And then I, I said some something in a letter and I never heard from him again. And I was trying to be helpful. Uh, and uh, <coughs> I corresponded a little bit with Captain Stebbins, company commander of George Company. He lost the use of his legs. Also, he was a cripple all the rest of his life. He lived a long time though that way. He lived in San Francisco. Uh, uh, anybody else? Like, that's pretty much all of them. So, um, <coughs> did you have nightmares after the war? No, I don't know if to call them nightmares. I think I just sometimes didn't sleep. And what about loud noises? 
No, I, I, I was never bothered by no, no, no I just, Um. You didn't do occupation duty, did you? No. Because you went to the mob, and so then from there they sent you home? Uh, well, yeah. <coughs> I went to Guam, and then they decided to send me for a short term at, uh, in uh, Honolulu. But we got to Honolulu, and they said, not here, go on to San Diego. <laughs> so I to San Diego. Well, in San Diego, I said, well, we need some room, and they sent me to Memphis. I could have gone back to duty months before that. I was just kind of lost. You know, they lost me. And I went to Memphis. And uh, finally, they found me and uh, said, send me back to duty at Philadelphia Navy Yard while I'm waiting discharge, get you discharge. I got over there. I was there overnight, and they said, uh, we're changing your orders. You're going to Crane, Indiana. So I went to Crane, Crane, Indiana by Crane. And I was there uh, six weeks. And they said, go up to the Great Lakes and get your discharge. I got up to the Great Lakes to get my discharge, and that went pretty smoothly. The interesting thing was the, uh, I checked into one of their barracks there, and they put me in a separate facility from the other guys because every one of those other guys had been a Japanese POW in the Philippines. And uh, he, the Navy center that checked me in and said, we're keeping you separate and you'd be better off just not talking to them because they're really on edge. <laughs> uh, so I didn't talk to them. But I, of course, I saw a lot of those guys around. They didn't bother me, and I didn't bother them. Did they act any different? I can't remember specifically any of that. But I took the sailor's word for it, that they were very edgy. And um. what, is it, what about them is if they had short fuses. Uh, they blew up easily. That's what he really said, in probably nicer terms than that. Yeah. Um, were there times on Okinawa that you had run out of ammunition? No, well, I think I always had a good supply. I can't remember a time. And what weapon? I don't you know where it came from. I don't remember seeing people deliver them. Yeah. I delivered them on, on Guam, but I don't remember those guys doing it for me. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. Well, uh, yeah. What weapon did you carry in combat? Huh? What weapon did you carry? M1. What did you think of the M1? Oh, I liked the M1. Yeah, for a weapon, yeah. That's good. I was reasonably good, reasonably good shot. Had that people side. Oh. And can you tell me the story about the two twins in your outfit? Yeah, we had uh, brothers, Tenuta brothers. They were twin brothers in our platoon. And uh, uh, so I don't know how much after the uh, Sullivan brothers situation it was, but uh, orders came that. Uh, uh, brothers uh, could not be in the in the same unit, and uh, these uh, Tenuta brothers, uh, Italian boys from Milwaukee, uh, had to separate, and uh, they did not take it gently. They wanted to be together, and uh, I guess it was probably Mr. Russo's job to explain to them you don't have a have a choice. But what they did do. <clears throat> was uh, leave one with us and one to an adjoining company. And apparently that was far enough. I'm not so sure that, uh, that it actually met the policy requirements. I wouldn't know, but but uh, that's what they did. Ironically, both of them were wounded 
but neither was killed. Can you talk to me about your uh, experiences with elephantitis? Well, I certainly never had it, but uh, some of the people that had been in the 22nd Marines for some time, particularly in uh, uh, Samoa and I think some other islands uh, where elephantitis was uh, prevalent, uh, had acquired that. And <clears throat> we had a fellow in our uh, company, and in fact our platoon, named uh, Gene Walmsley from West Virginia. And uh, Walmsley had elephantitis, uh, but they made the decisions to uh, uh, repatriate people back to the United States for treatment based on the measurement of the limb that was swollen. And if it wasn't swollen by uh, a certain uh, number of inches, they, uh, the person had to stay on duty. Uh, Walmsley barely qualified for repatriation back to the United States just before we left for Okinawa. Yeah. We were glad for him because he, he had been in uh, the Anahuitak campaign, he'd been in the uh, Guam campaign, and had been through some really tough things, and he, it was nice that he could go home. They sent him to a hospital in Oregon uh, for uh, treatment. How old would you say he was? Uh, maybe 26 or so. I don't really know. I'm surprised I remembered his name. It all comes back to you eventually. What was the name of that provisional outfit you were in on Guam? The brigade? Yeah, yeah. Well, the full title was First Marine Provisional Brigade. We just usually referred to it as a First Brigade. So. First Provisional Marine Brigade? Could that right. be the same one? Yep. Were they in Iceland originally? That's possible. Yeah, Iceland and Guam. Shepherd, yep. Lem Lemuel. Lemuel? Huh? Lemuel C. Shepherd? Lemuel Shepherd, yeah. Lemuel. I've never heard that name before. Have you ever heard that name? Lemuel? Lemuel. It's L E M U E L. Lemuel. Yeah, have you ever heard that? Lemuel? Anyone else? No, I haven't. It's probably a family name that back in his genealogy somewhere, but no, I never heard it anywhere else. Tell, tell me about your job of bringing ammunition to the front lines. I mean, explain to me, where would you get the ammunition? How would you bring it? Well, we were right at the beach, Agate Beach. And they'd bring that in on uh, a little naval boat. Uh, they put down a ramp. We go aboard the uh, ramp and pick up. It. The 30 caliber uh, ammunition came in fairly large wooden boxes. And we load uh, several of those into the Amtrak and uh, take it up to the uh, uh, line where the uh, 22nd Marines were. And then uh, just at offload it wherever they wanted us to offload it. If there were dead or wounded, uh, or if there were materials to take back, we'd load that up and then take it take it back. Uh, it was pretty simple, really. Unless you're burying somebody. <laughs> yeah. Actually, we had a lot of different little tasks. One time I picked up a uh, a uh, Nambu light machine gun that was just left laying there by the tw somebody in the 22nd. I picked it up and threw it in the Amtrak and I was going to try to find some place to store it, except I didn't have any place to store it. You know, I'm, in, I'm out in the open in the, on the beach, uh, slept on the beach if I got some sleep. And uh, this uh, 
naval officer on an LST. The LST was run up almost on the land. And uh, he saw that in Nambu. And I couldn't just keep carrying it around. You know. He offered me six roast beef sandwiches <laughs> for that Nambu. And like a dang fool, I gave it to him. But I didn't have much choice, really. What else would you have done? Yeah, yeah. What I was intending to do was to dismantle it and mail it to that uncle. Yeah. It, uh, that didn't work out. That How was, were the sandwiches? Huh? How were the sandwiches? They were good. Of course, the food I had been eating was just sea rations. So they weren't very good anyway. But that was a dead body. The Japanese bodies float, uh, boating. Are you talking about it on land? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, since we, it's pretty tropical uh, in uh, uh, Guam and to some, even on Okinawa, with the cooler weather, it doesn't take long for the f flies to gather. It creates a lot of maggots in the apertures of the body, the mouth, the nose. The maggots are crawling all over them in very short order. It's uh, pretty disgusting. And uh, uh, I have a, a real problem with sense of smell. And uh, I may be full of beans, but I've felt for a long time that I lost some of my sense of smell when I was working on those bodies. But I don't really, I can't say scientifically that that's true. You felt like after you, I mean, I mean, but you smelt them, you smelt that odor. Terrible odor. But now I don't smell that odor. I, I, I went back to Iowa and I couldn't smell skunk. Truthfully. Really? That, that happened. Dead skunk or skunk spray? A skunk. Skunk spray. They used to be around a skunk in Iowa. Anywhere near it, you could smell it. I couldn't smell it. No. Oh, I, I, th I think it had something to do with this sort of traumatic kind of thing. Maybe. But, but I, I've never set out to try to prove that or to do anything about it. I just accept the fact that I don't have a very good sense of smell. Yeah. Yeah. Did, I, did I tell you that on Guam, when I joined the first platoon, uh, first joined the first platoon, they were down to seven guys. Okay. He, Walt was the platoon leader. It was a corporal, and he was a, a platoon leader. And uh, he filled me in a lot about about that night and uh, and what they saw uh, of the Banzai charge and, and how they dealt with it. Uh, uh, but no, I, was, I, do, I don't remember hearing any of them, Banzai yells and that sort of thing, but I heard gunfire. What life advice do you want to give to future generations? About combat or about life? General life advice. Well, don't spend a lot of time. profit from the past, but focus on the future. That's which is, I think I found to be a really good lifestyle. Uh, that's short enough. <laughs> no, I mean, you, I mean, I mean, the the like. Imagine if you're talking to your great 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 grandkids. Yeah. What would you want them to know for their life? What would I what? Imagine you're talking to your great 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 grandkids. Yeah. What would you want them to know for their life? Well, I would hope that they would understand that. After all is said and done, people are pretty much alike with the same aspirations, same needs, and uh, that we need to uh, aid and abet people in reaching those, the goals they want to reach, as long as they're peaceful. Oh. Beautiful. Yeah. <coughs> were you afraid of getting killed when you were in combat? 
I mean, did you think about the fact that you could get killed? Oh, sure. Yeah. I somehow had faith that I wasn't. But that didn't mean I wasn't afraid. I was afraid. I, I don't, it'd be really hard to avoid. But it, it, in the midst of combat, it is not too difficult to uh, forget your fear if you're concentrating on something you're supposed to be doing. Uh, uh, that's very helpful. But if you sit in, I can imagine sitting and worrying about it and not doing anything, that'd be a good way to end up under your hand. Uh, oh. So tell me, um, I mean, do you believe that there's a higher being? Probably. Like God? Yeah, probably. But I don't, uh, I'm not a big fan of organized religion because there's something very presumptuous about that. That, that, that we in this religion can interpret for you all of these significant uh, facts about the importance of life and death. And, and it's wonderful that they have some very smart people try to do that. And there's some great theologians, but it's still presumptuous. I, don't, I think maybe as uh, science progresses more and more, we learn more and more, we will, and there's a, assuming there's a God, that we'll learn more and more about how God works, uh, which is, will change, our, change our human destinies quite a lot if we get to that point. Right now we can't even find facts and agree on what they are. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a... Sorry about that. <laughs> I thought there was a Trump sign outside. No, no not my house. <laughs> no. No. No, don't worry. I'm, huh? from, I'm from California as well. I have uh, <coughs> found him to be, uh, from the first time heard him, a con man. I mean, I used to have, I taught graduate seminars for about 13 years. You know? Rarely, but once in a while, you get, a guy comes in, talks a blue streak and doesn't say anything. And I, I've learned to pick those guys off pretty fast, and he's one of them. The first time I heard him, he said, come on, man. This is a photo of uh, Lieutenant Edward Roos, originally from Englewood, New Jersey. He was my platoon leader on Okinawa. Uh, he was killed at uh, Sugarloaf Hill. Uh, the situation was that he uh, was <clears throat> attempting to uh, keep a tank from getting uh, too far away from uh, infantry protection. And uh, he went out to uh, uh, talk through the telephone to the tank captain. And uh, he was injured twice going out and again severely in the abdomen when he came back. And uh, he succumbed to his injuries. He was later awarded the Navy Cross for his uh, <clears throat> incredible courage at, uh, at Sugar Oaf Hill in Okinawa. I was with him when he was uh, subjected to those injuries. We talked about the fact that a tank was getting too far out away from us for its own protection. And uh, I suggested that uh, perhaps I should go out and uh, talk to the tank captain through the, through, uh, the tank's telephone. Uh, and uh, he vetoed that and uh, went himself, uh, went out and uh, was injured twice, uh, reaching the tank, uh, talked to the tank, uh, indicating to them that they should uh, back, uh, drop back a ways. And then he was, uh, Dr. Mr. Roos was also injured once again, this time in the abdomen as he was returning uh, to the area where I was uh, staying. So. 
he succumbed uh, a short time after that. By the time he got back to where you were, I mean, what kind of state was he in? Pain, a lot of pain, and he wasn't talking. Yeah. So. What did he do? I mean, were you all in a foxhole, or where, where were you dug in? No, we were just, uh, uh, as I recall, we were just kind of behind a mound, a low mound. We didn't have a lot of protection ourselves there. There was a lot of gunfire going on. Uh, you know, coming in in our direction. And, and when he came back to your position, what did he do? It's kind of collapsed. And uh, Corman came, Navy Corman came and uh, tagged him uh, and uh, arranged for uh, Amtrak to take him. Uh, that's the last I saw him. He didn't, didn't live. Was he alive when he got on the Amtrak? Yes. Yes, he was. But I don't think he survived much longer. Um, explain to me... <coughs> can, can you talk to me about just where your position was? Where were you when this happened? Sugarloaf. Well, it was at the base of Sugarloaf Hill. Uh, well, it would be on the sort of the north west side of the of the hill. And, and, and how far away was that tank? Quite a ways, maybe 50, 60 yards. I don't really remember for sure, of course. Yeah, it was out there all, all by itself, and uh, uh, no, no other uh, uh, Marines there to uh, protect him from the Japanese coming out and uh, giving, you know, throwing a Molotov cocktail or putting a bomb under it or whatever. It, it had no protection. Did the tank backtrack after yes. Bruce? Yes, yeah. it came back. Mm -hmm. So... When he got hit, he lurched, and uh, on one of the times, I don't remember which one, it hit him so hard that he went down on one knee, but then got back up and proceeded to the uh, tank, and then when he started back, then he was hit once more, and that was uh, a, a, really a very uh, serious injury. All of them were, I think. And this was all by what kind of fire? Rifle fire. All by rifle fire. What kind of person was Roos? Well, he seemed to be a natural leader. He, uh, he knew his men uh, and uh, he dealt with them with a, with a certain amount of equality, you might call it, but you knew that he was in charge uh, by his demeanor. Uh, he had a good sense of humor. Uh, he was seemed to be very smart, uh, and uh, he had a background in uh, football and in law enforcement. So he'd had, uh, even though only 28 years old, he'd had a lot of experience. Uh, he had been a, a, a participant in the invasion of, of Inuitak and of Guam uh, prior to the Okinawa campaign. Um, did he have any children or no? No. Um, did you visit any of his family members after the war or did you? No, I didn't even look for them until after I retired. And he had a, uh, a brother who was uh, in the military, I think in Europe. But, uh, and then he had, I think he had two brothers, uh, but I think only one was in the military, but I'm not sure of that even. Um, so I'm not that well informed on his family. Can you tell me, um, 
But before, I mean, what, but before this incident where you and, how did you and Roos end up there in the first place? Well, we, we had started out sometime before to try to join up with uh, other units of uh, 1st Battalion and Easy Company on, on um, Sherlock. And that's as far as we had gotten at that particular point. And you had mentioned to me earlier, this is off topic, but you had mentioned to me about some of the fighting on the top of Sugarloaf. Yes. What do you remember about that? Well, <clears throat> my main memory of it is just, uh, you know, f firing into, uh, into uh, spaces where we believe there were uh, Japanese soldiers uh, hidden. And uh, or behind uh, behind uh, structures that were designed for defense, and uh, I do remember uh, very vividly seeing uh, Lieutenant Bear, our company exec officer, who now was had become our company uh, commander, uh, using a full-size 30 caliber machine gun uh, by cradling it in his hand and then firing it into spaces where he wanted us to uh, exercise firepower and try to overcome the, uh, the Japanese soldiers there. <laughs>